Jewish distinctions um, over against the Gentiles. In order to be identified as a Jew, a person must be circumcised and he must be obeying food laws. These are not the only requirements to be obeyed in the social community of the Jews, but these were the make or break points for the Jews. Those who obeyed these laws were also assumed to obey all the other requirements of the Mosaic law. I'm sorry, there will be a prayer here. I'll just stop for a minute. I hope I'm audible to you now. Is it okay if I continue? Yeah, please continue, sir. Please continue, sir. Okay. So among these circumcision plays an important role. In the Old Testament, circumcision becomes an important identification mark of the Jews. Genesis 17, 14 says, but an uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. John Golding says this, it is clear that circumcision is to be an indispensable mark of being a member of the people of the promise. Thus, covenantal community is directly marked by the circumcision. So circumcision marks those who belong to the community and those who are outside of the community, especially the Jewish one we are talking about. This is how it, it may look at in a diagrammatic sense. If you look at those who are inside the circle or call this Jews because they have the, you know they have gone through circumcision and the outsiders are considered as gentiles because they did not go through circumcision jewish missionary movements in the intertestinal period encouraged the gentiles to worship the one true god over against the other gods of the mediterranean world and we see josephus talk about uh, the pharisees who are merchants who go into mediterranean and also convert the princes and other things in antiquities the Jews encouraged the Gentiles to join the covenantal community. The Gentiles who did not accept the circumcision were not called proselytes, but they were called as God-fearers. They are not really God's people. They are considered as God-fearer. And we see Forgues and Everett Forgues and says that by not accepting the circumcision, the God-fearers could not get the full identification with the Jewish community. And thus they did not have full privileges the proselytes had. He further says circumcision was the only requirement for foreign proselytism uh, to Judaism according to the written law. And thus it was forcefully administered to the Gentiles who wanted to convert to Judaism. Whoever wanted to be part of the saved community and worship the true God should become part of the Jewish community by accepting the laws of the community and its custom, especially when circumcision. The first step is to accept circumcision. Thus for a Gentile, to accept circumcision is to become a part of the saved community. Thus, the first requirement to be a saved, saved, saved member of the community is circumcision. If this is a common phenomenon in the Jewish practice of first century Judaism, it is possible that Judaizers were also doing similar things in their practice. This could be the reason why the Judaizers were forcing, enforcing circumcision on the Gentiles. They probably wanted the Gentile Christians of Galatia to be the full members of the saved community. It does not seem like the Judaizers were preaching a merit amassing gospel. It does not appear as though they were teaching the Gentiles of Galatia to keep the law to achieve merits and to be saved. However, though there were no merit amassing legalism in the gospel of the Judaizers, Paul found some serious theological problem when circumcision was enforced on the Gentiles in order to be saved or to enjoy themselves within the saved community. Paul's worldview presented a different scenario. For Paul, the food laws of Judaism and the practice of circumcision need not be imposed on the Gentiles as a means of entrance for the Gentiles into this Christian community. Romans chapter 10, 12 is a very important verse here, for there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile. And I've read this verse earlier, same thing I'm reading in Galatians 3, 28, where he says that, the Jew and Gentile are not different for Paul by reinforcing the barriers that Judaizers make the Gentile believers of Galatians, uh, sorry, of, of I mean Galatia to work out their salvation because by reinforcing these boundary markers, they infer that to be a full member of the covenantal community, they need to perform their Jewish distinctive laws. This working out of salvation is legalism for Paul as salvation comes only from faith in Christ. 
Paul repeatedly say, just have to have faith in Jesus Christ. It is the only means of salvation. But when these Judaizers implied that the Gentiles should go through circumcision in order to be saved, they are making this appear as legalism. The whole book of Galatians was Paul's argument against legalism, sorry, legalistic gnomism propagated by the Judaizers. So this is the crux of the message of the book of Galatians. So let us move on to Romans and we, I mean, we don't have much time. So let's move on to Romans and see how it is connected. Much of the thing that Paul is talking about in the book of Galatians is also very important because he is going to bring these ideas there. I think in the way that he approached Romans, Paul had refined his thought refined his argument and he had structured it so beautifully but the matter that he is discussing in the book of Romans is very similar to that of Galatians as well so we'll look at this one and then see how Paul goes on and I like the structure of Romans better in the way that he organized these things and the way that you know he approached the whole thing I think Paul had a plenty of time to just think and then you know write about these things and we know that you know um, we know that Paul was going to Jerusalem at this time and he was, he was in Corinth for uh, a few months and he had plenty of time as he was just approaching Jerusalem. He had to also showcase his gospel to the people. So most probably he thought about his gospel really well and structured it. And as he was really thinking about this gospel, which has to be presented to the Jerusalem people and it was right time for him to also pen these things down. And so he was writing these things with much clarity and it's uh, the beauty of Romans come through the structure that he has. It is not easy to give a short introduction on Romans. However, in the following subtitles, some of the important aspects of the book are brought forth to give the short introduction. I believe marketing imagery is an important one or interesting one for us to use to understand the book of Romans. Marketing imageries could be used to explain what Paul does in Romans. In our bazaars or in our stores, marketing a product may involve several strategies. When there is much competition, the seller may use various strategies to market their products. For example, they have something called ambush marketing. Ambush marketing is if you want to promote your product, you put down the other product, you trash talk the other products. And so we have these kind of things uh, in the marketing thing. So what happens here is this, if Paul's product could be called as his gospel, which is righteousness by faith in Jesus Christ, he only talks about it in chapter three, verse 21 onwards. He's not talking about his gospel in the beginning at all. He gives his product as the answer to the problems he's describing from chapter one, verse 18 onwards. Like a good competitive salesman, Paul puts down the other two ways of attaining righteousness, which is um, by worshiping idols and also obeying the law. And so he's putting down these two ways of attaining righteousness. And then he shows that both the products cannot deliver the de desired result, which is righteousness, but they will produce sins, which is the opposite of the desired results. So if you go through these kind of products, you are aiming to be righteous, but you are not going to be righteous. You will you will get sins. So which is the argument that Paul is trying to say? So he's saying, if you go through, um, I mean, if you go through idol worship, you will have sins. And if you go through law in order to be saved, you will have sins. So it is the argument that Paul is trying to say. And if you are wanting to be righteous, if you want to remove all your sins through these things, you will never succeed, which is the argument that Paul is trying to say. In Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 32, Paul talks about these important things. He says this one. Yeah. He says this one, that through the idol worship, you are having wrath of God. While doing so, Paul begins his argument by highlighting the result that this idol worship leads them to the wrath of God. Though the Gentiles knew the creator God, they neglected him, did not honor him as God and and because of that, they have exchanged that glory to the idols and it brought only excessive sins, including sexual immorality, homosexuality. These sins brought forth the wrath of God. So Paul is trying to say that, you know, you already knew God, you know God, but you did not honor him. 
you went to the idols and because of this you have excessive sins these are false views i'm just reflecting what paul is trying to say later on in chapter 2 onwards until 320 paul shows how the jewish people are also sinners he identifies that in a beautiful way he is saying that you have the laws and you are saying that you know you have the law but you are not doing this law you are not obeying the law you are breaking the law and because of this you have sins and he is even quoting the old testament codes a lot of quotes that he is using to identify sin is there in your flesh in your body and he identifies in throat tongues lips mouth feet and in the eyes you have sins so he is quoting old testament in order to identify the jewish people are also sinners and he is quoting old testament psalm 14 and also from 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 moment uh, 53 he says that none is righteous no not one and then goes on to say both jews and greeks are under sin and paul points out that jewish people are also sinners and the way that paul brings in these things is by identifying how a person will be justified and he says in 321 to 31 paul stresses that a person can be justified by having faith in jesus christ alone he says this one in 21 to 22 but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction for both the Jews and the Gentiles. Uh, we have only one way that faith is the only means of achieving righteousness. Apart from this, Paul already gave his answer, his solution, and he had uplifted his gospel over against the two other ways of achieving righteousness but apart from this to sell a product big companies usually use the product ambassadors product ambassador on the roads of big cities you can see billboards and colorful lights showing celebrities promoting various products similarly paul now brings in two important celebrities from the jewish history and we see abraham and david these are two great leaders of jewish nation and they are identified as the ambassadors who also were justified by having faith in Jesus Christ. So Paul says, Abraham believed in God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And because of that, we also need to believe in God in order to be righteous. We don't have to go through circumcision in order for us to be saved. So that's what Paul's argument is. And he has a beautiful argument there in this place. But later on in chapter five, he says something very important. So in chapter five, he says that to sell a product, an expert marketing person would talk about the positive aspect benefits of the product. And here Paul is talking about three important, three important benefits of the product. Number one is that peace with God. If you receive this gospel, if you believe in this gospel, you will have peace with God. Number two, you will have grace from God. Number three, you will have the hope of glory of God. And the structure is really beautiful. He uses this parallel structure. 5152, 52B, he is just saying this. And then later on, he goes on to clarify this one in 6 to 11, and then verses 12 to 21, and then 21B. So he's talking about this so beautifully in order to identify the benefits of the gospel. And how? How do you receive this hope of glory of God? The hope comes from character. We need to have character in order to go to this hope of this glory of God. And how it comes? It's by endurance. How the endurance comes? It is by suffering and how the suffering comes or through the suffering that you will have this hope of the glory of God. It is the idea that Paul is trying to say. This time of COVID-19, we have several problems around. We see suffering around. But one thing that we can be assured from the words of Paul is that suffering is important in our lives so that we can have the hope of glory of God according to Paul. Few of the prosperity preachers would say that, you know, if you are a Christian and you will receive all the blessings, but according to Paul, suffering is very, very important for us to receive this hope of the glory of God. So after promoting his product, Paul finds a potential problem in his argument. If you are declared righteous before God by having faith in Jesus Christ, can we continue in sin? And he asked this question in chapter six, verse one. So he goes on to talk about this one, addresses about this one in chapter 6 and 7. In chapter 6, verses 1 to 14, as I don't have much time, I'm just reading this one. I have 5 or 10 minutes more, so I'm going to 
uh, just uh, go through my slides instead of read my paper. 6, 1 to 14, he says that be holy by being dead to sin. So if you are dead to sin, if you are dead to anything, you will not be active. You will not be alive. If you are dead, if you keep biryani in front of you, you will not be active. I mean, your senses will not be active. It will not salivate in your mouth. So hmm. it will not, you know, uh, uh, provoke you to sin. So similarly, Paul here is saying, be holy by being dead to sin. Uh, be holy by being slaves to righteousness. As we are in sin, if you are slaves to righteousness, we automatically sin. Here he says that let us be slaves to righteousness and then we can live a holy life and be dead to the law, he says. And later on, why law does not help in the salvation? He goes on to extensively talk about this one. He says that the flesh is the problem. Flesh has the problem. Law is good. Law is holy. Law does not have any problem. But when the law is applied on the flesh, what happens is the flesh inadvertently bring forth sins. As I said here, law plus flesh equals sin. So Paul blames everything on flesh. And he just uses this Philonic idea and Platonic idea here and then blames flesh uh, as the cause of sin, not the law. So for Paul, law does not have the capacity to bring forth righteousness in a human how do we do that? If law does not have the capacity, how do we go about it? Paul gives an answer. He says, Holy Spirit is there. Holy Spirit brings forth the, the essential goodness in this uh, life by transforming the body, by transforming this flesh. These verses are very, very important in chapter 8. He says that, you know, God, he condemns sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. Please notice this one. The requirements of the law should be fulfilled in us. And in one sense, we can say that, you know, Jesus has already done everything in order to have this requirements of the law fulfilled in us by according to this verse. But if you notice, the last part of this verse is very, very important. But the requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk according to the flesh, sorry, who, who, who do not walk according to the flesh, but walk according to the spirit. So this requirements of the law will be fulfilled in us only when we walk according to the spirit. So Paul is giving us a way out where he's saying we have to walk according to the spirit in order to have all the law requirement, uh, you know, fulfilled in us. In one sense, Jesus Christ has completed everything for us, but on the other side of the coin is that we also have to walk according to the uh, spirit so that we can bring forth those righteous aspects in our life. So I call this one as pneumatic hypothesis, pneumatic gnomism in the sense, obeying the law in the spirit and pneumatic peripathism is that walking according to the spirit. Paul says that as we walk according to the spirit, we will be holy, we will be righteous. And I call this one as pneumatic phronism. Phronism means that we have to keep our mind on the things of the spirit. Setting the mind is the word in Greek and we have to set the mind on the spirit. As we do that, we will be holy and we have to be in the spirit in order for us to be holy, Paul says. We have to be in the spirit, en pneumati. We know en, en, en Christi, but here en pneumati is the one that he's saying. Pneumatic zoism, we have to live according to the spirit for Paul in order to be righteous. And we have to also put the deeds of the flesh to death in order to have this righteousness come into this. So I call this one as pneumatic thanatism, as a cowboy who just takes the gun and then shoots the things as the deeds of flesh comes out of our flesh. We have to be conscious of those things and shoot down the deeds of the flesh to death. So, and then last one is we have to be led by the spirit. Let me just finish in last five minutes. Uh, do I have five minutes? Min Lun? Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Yeah. So, yeah, also. thank you. So, agapal nomism is the last concept that I want to talk about. Agapal nomism is, uh, is, is I mean, nothing but obeying the law through love. Paul repeatedly says this over and over again. He says this, and um, we can see this one in Romans chapter twelve onwards until fourteen, and uh, fourteen and fifteen also, and he will just talk about this one by how can we live a holy life by loving other people. And I will end with this one. 
I have extensively written all these things. It would be nice if I could read, but because I don't have time, I will just uh, go through the slide and finish this one. And, and I can explain that one later if we have more questions. Agapal nomism is nothing but where Paul says in 12, three to eight, that give opportunity to all believers in using their gifts in the church. We see that the problem in the church is that two groups are there and we see weaker brethren are there and then we have stronger brethren are there. And so we see that Jewish people who went out in the time of Claudius and who had come back into the church. And so these people were the leaders of the church earlier, but now they have just come to the church. They are not the leaders anymore. And uh, I think that Paul was uh, see, seeing the need that the majority, the Gentiles were not giving opportunity for the Jewish people to operate their gifts in the church. So Paul says, give opportunity to the, all the believers in order that they can use their gift also in the church. And Paul says, do good to all in chapter 12, 9 to 21. And then he says that submit to the governing authorities. And then later he says that be holy by loving one another. I will talk about this verse later on because this is a very key verse. And then he says that accept the weak members and accommodate them. And we have to also accommodate the weak members, especially in the aspect of food offered to the idols and other things he talks about. So this verse is important. These verses are important. Uh, in, in, in chapter 13 verses 8 to 10, sorry, 8 to 9, Paul talks about this one. Oh, no one thing except to love each other. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. And any other commandment are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourselves. So for Paul, what happens here is this. If you really are Christian, you have to love the other people. By loving your neighbor, what happens is you automatically fulfill the law. So law requirements ought to be fulfilled. And how are you going to fulfill it is by obeying the law through love. When you love the other people, you will succeed in this one. This is not just there in the book of Romans. It is also there in the book of Galatians. If you notice 5, 13 to 15, Paul says that you have to fulfill the law by loving others. And then 5, 16 to 26, he says that the Holy Spirit is there. And then 6, 1 to 6, he's talking about how to be holy by loving others. And 6, 7 to 8, he's talking about spirit. And later on, he's talking about love also. So this concept of pneumatic nomism and agapal nomism are already there in Galatians. Paul is bringing this one in more details and with a good structure in explaining these things. So as Paul talked about this one, the whole structure of Romans is this. We, you know, you need to be saved. You will not be saved by idol worship or by, by, by the obedience of the law. You need to believe in Jesus Christ in order to be saved. And then he points out the benefits of this, uh, you know, of this gospel. Later on, he goes on to share, how can you be holy? And in the midst of it, and he says in 9 to 1, sorry, I mean, in chapters 9 to 11, he goes on to talk about uh, the status of the Jewish people and how they will be accommodated later on. And so it is a digression, I believe, that he goes on to talk about that one. But primary thing that he says is that we are saved by faith in Jesus Christ alone. And then later on, he goes on to this aspect. We have to live a holy life. And how can we live a holy life is by having this Holy Spirit or by the help of the Holy Spirit. And number two, by following this love or the law of love, we can fulfill the requirements of the law. One thing I want to stress is that for Paul, the requirements of the law is very, very important or very, very important. And by which that, you know, we can be holy and we can be righteous. So that's the point that Paul is trying to say. Thank you very much for the opportunity. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bennett. And it was a unique privilege to hear from uh, your uh, rhetoric. That is that when we talk about following uh, interpretation and theology, you know that the uh, key person is Jesus himself, from Jesus to Paul, from Paul to St. Augustine, from St. Augustine to Martin Luther, from Martin Luther to E.P. Scientist, James P. G. Dunn, and now we are in Bennett Lawrence. So that is the sequence of interpretation we see about, okay, uh, sorry, agapical nomism and pneumatic nomism and various other, okay, uh, 
uh, interpretative frameworks. So that when we look at the Pauline framework, the 13 or 14 epistles, the first four epistles are called the, the major epistles, okay, Galatians, Romans, 1st Corinthians, and 2nd Corinthians, and the second category is the uh, personal epistles. There comes Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon. Then comes the eschatological epistles, 1st Thessalonians and 2nd Thessalonians, and the pastoral epistles, okay, 1st Timothy, 2nd Timothy, and Titus. So we have just started the Pauline, okay, uh, what is that called, the corpus today. So he is inaugurating a new frame in our overall wider contextualized biblical hermeneutics framework. So far we were dealing with the Gospels and the Book of Acts and uh, today onward we are dealing with the uh, Pauline narrative framework. So in that case it was a very good introduction. Okay. So when we talk about Paul, the two key books are Romans and Galatians. So you will have got a nutshell within 45 minutes. So he was giving a lot of new idiosyncratic aspects and various other planets from these two excellent books. So especially when we talk, talk about the Romans, according to C.K. Barrett, Romans is a Christian classic that comes to the category of all the Platonic writings, Aristotelian writings. Such is the range of Romans. And after hearing from the uh, rhetoric of uh, Dr. Bennett, now it is our time to raise our questions. And uh, uh, you can be free to ask any sort of questions. But I have seen in between some uh, chat comments uh, from many uh, participants. Uh, one is from Reverend Prasad Matthew. And he says that, Sir, I have some reservations to accept the ambush marketing as the mother of St. Paul in conveying gospel. Also, I do have reservations to accept the way it is presented to sell the product. Do you have any comments about that? Um, sir, I do agree uh, in that sense. Um, Sometimes when we take the scripture, the word of God, and uh, explain it in the common terms, it may appear as we are diluting the sanctity of the word. Uh, those things are there, and it is not intended at all. The reason why we are bringing these ideas here is to uh, facilitate the understanding better. So it is the only reason why we are doing this, and we have high view of scripture. And we don't want to, um, and we don't want to put down the word. And the way that Paul uh, handles the whole thing is that we can even change that one into a problem-solution aspect. He establishes the problem really well, and he says, if you go through idol worship, you will not be saved. And then, if you go through the law obedience, you will not be saved. So, as a marketing person, he is saying. Again, I said marketing person. He's not a marketing person. I'm just using an imaginary. So, uh, you know, if he goes in that aspect, he's establishing the need really well. And when he does that, when he establishes the need really well, it is easier for him to give the solution. <laughs> and we as, we as academician, and we know that, you know, uh, when we write the thesis and dissertation, we have to establish the statement of the problem really, really well. So I think Paul is doing that in rhetoric. You have to establish the problem really well. So Paul is doing that so beautifully. I could read that with the rhetoric aspect. I could re re read the whole thing in so many different ways. But I'm just reading this one as a marketing thing because it just brings in so many things together. But it doesn't mean that we are diluting the message of the word. Not at all. So at the same time, you see that uh, when we hear a lecture or a presentation, uh, there are myriad possibilities as well as multifarious angles of okay, uh, looking at it. 
So on the other hand, the other uh, statement here is that uh, thank you very much, sir. Marketing strategy was outstanding. Okay, I'm telling about the other side of okay your presentation. And uh, one question that I have seen now is from Shamuel Sunit, Dr. Bennett, how can we balance grace and law in the present church community and self? I think it's a very important question. It's a relevant question. Uh, grace and law, especially in the recent times, we have this something called hyper grace. Hyper grace ideas are coming out and, uh, you know, overemphasizing grace. I think John Barclay's recent book is a very, very important book. John Barclay's book that uh, Paul and the Gift is the book name. And I just have it in my shelf. So, I think that book explains the whole aspect of grace itself. The word grace, he is doing a very good word study in it. And then he goes on to say that the word grace, you know, we could consider that one as a gift. But what happens is that this gift with that sociological embedded, um, you know, expectation there is that when you see someone giving the gift, it doesn't mean that you can just take it and do whatever you want. But when you receive the gift, you automatically have some other kind of aspect involved in that that you have to return the favor. If you receive a gift, you have to do something about it. So in that light, God has given us the salvation and then righteousness to us. And it is the gift from God and it is grace. But it also has other element involved in there where you have to perform, you have to do certain things, the requirements of the law. So it is also embedded there. John Barclay is saying that in this book, Paul and the Gift. It's a beautiful book. The reason book is a uh, a little thick one, but it's a very good book. Uh, so, another question uh, is asked by Francis Uttri Raj. Sir, after whole, what are the duties of leaders of the church regarding agapal novism? And also, should we follow Moses' laws regarding circumcision? I'll take the second question uh, first. I think Paul strongly had mentioned that we don't have to go to circumcision for salvation. And he had been mentioning that writing over and over again. And in that sense, we need not, we should not go through circumcision for salvation. So the second point that uh, you, 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 you mean talked about is that, uh, how about agapal nomism? See, agapal nomism is taught not just by Paul. But even Jesus talked about it. it is a common framework in the Christianity. Christianity uh, thrived because of this one. Love was the key of Christian uh, teachings from the beginning until now, through the you know through the centuries. Uh, it should not only be talked about by the uh, leaders of our church, and I think it should become a culture. It should infiltrate in every Christian member, and we all should behave in that way. We, we should bring forth those things in our life. It's just so simplified in Paul's words. If you notice this one, that you have heard that, you know, you shall not commit adultery. But if you truly love your brother, you will not commit adultery with his wife. So it is just so beautifully structured. Paul is just talking about this. The thieving and then stealing, all these things can be avoided if we follow this law of love. John chapter 15 is, is, is I mean, another place where Jesus talks about it so beautifully. So I uh, give time to Father Matthew Chandra Gunnail. He has some concerns and questions. Yes, sir. yes uh, Dr. Bennett, uh, thank you very much for this uh, erudite and scholarly uh, presentation. And you have given uh, a wonderful uh, remembering uh, presentation that is very valuable to our understanding of Romans and Galatians. My question is about uh, Paul. See, uh, uh, it is excellent that you have put it in the, the marketing strategies of Paul using modern vocabulary and terminologies. And uh, what I found in uh, Paul is that, you know, as a uh, Judaizer, he has his own project. He was galloping towards um, Damascus and fallen. And uh, we see that a total turning around. And uh, even in the Areopagus, uh, there he is speaking about um, Christ, 
you know every moment he, he is speaking about christ and becoming the consciousness of christ so whether uh, paul is it because of his psychology that means you know uh, all these marketing strategies and all preaching christ is it because of his psychology or of his of the grace he has been received so as a scholar what would you differentiate between these two i think the grace uh, is the is the important aspect there i think sir but more than that i think uh, paul's understanding of this world paul's understanding of god's work in this world what happened to peter in acts chapter 10 sometime it happened to paul also we don't know when it really happened but paul also went through this experience where he got this serious conviction that god is dealing with the gentiles and the jewish people the same way and this this whole thought brought a radical change in his theology and 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 also ministry i believe so he began to go to the gentiles left and right and he wanted them to come and because of this um uh, idea that all can come to god all have equal standing with god that psychological change or his his is some I mean, change in perspective altered his whole theology i think so i agree with richard longnecker 328 328 of galatians a very very key words he changed his whole perspective and he was fighting for the weaker brethren all the time i really like this aspect if you notice any book that you take of paul he will always go with the weaker people so in the book of galatians he will side with the gentiles in the book of romans he is siding with the jewish people jewish people are the minority in romans and we 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 see that in sorry i mean in the book of galatians they are the less powerful so in that sense paul is siding with the minority weaker people and he was supporting them so he is a champion and also example for all of us to stand with the weaker people so his psychology and his experience all these would have played a major role in his theology sir. thank you so thank you another question from dop kitchen sir would you elaborate on paul sandy nomism as some would consider him a sandy nomic there as his stand on law doesn't seem so andy and what is your take on this sir i think romans chapter 7 as i explained is the key thing in order to uh, prevent from calling paul as an antinomian and paul there he says that it is not the law law does not bring forth this this uh, this uh, sins see paul said two things 350 of romans and also sorry 320 of romans 520 of romans in the two places paul said something very very interesting he said that law is the cause of sin law sorry law brings for the lot of sins law brings the awareness of sins so he said that in two places 320 and then 520 what happens there is that for paul he already mentioned law brings forth sin so if you had just ended it there we can say paul is an antinomian he was against the law but if you notice very clearly in 7 he says that it is not the problem of the law it is because of the flesh law is good and holy but when it is applied to the flesh flesh brings forth all these things law does not have the capacity to transform the body and for which we need the holy spirit so paul is going on talking about the role of holy spirit in having this righteous life in chapter 8 because of this important thing so he is not blaming the law and also if you uh, you know really look at this one and i also asked ask ep e. sanders personally and he was also mentioning the same thing see for paul law is not thrown away he is talking against the law especially in the aspect of circumcision forced as a means of salvation but if you really ask paul should we keep the law he will say please mm -hmm. for your holiness you have to keep the law he will say yeah, i know i'm just treading on a <laughs> high sea so but, <laughs> but i just want to make, make yes sir may I make a question yes, yes sir, sir. <laughs> yes thank you dr bennett are you able to hear me yes sir yes sir thank you dr bennett greetings from madurai yes, and uh, it's a joy to hear you thank you for bringing uh, uh, dr ep sanders uh, very much uh, in the picture i was a student of dr ep sanders when i was in oxford uh, i had the privilege of sitting in his classes i asked him a question 
uh, you know, when he was talking about this governmental normism, <clears throat> this, uh, you also mentioned uh, very briefly about Romans 13, 1 to 7. Now you will understand what I'm going to ask you. <laughs> Romans 13, 1 to 7. <laughs> Obey the government orders. Obey the government orders. Uh, I told him that it, uh, Paul would not have written this, uh, should not have written this because the very same Paul who calls the Roman Empire, the Roman king as a murderer in uh, 1 Corinthians 2.8. You all know that in 1 Corinthians 2, 8, Paul calls the Roman emperor as a murderer. Will he ask uh, us to obey the Roman emperor, the murderer? Uh, that, that was the question which I asked as an Indian, as a South Indian, I asked him. I told him whether it, would, it could be an interpolation. Could it be an interpolation? Hmm? We are entering into a, a, new, a new era of uh, reading the... Uh, epistles. Thank you for starting this. Uh, what is your opinion? He really uh, slightly agreed that it could be an interpolation. I remember that. Uh, but what is your interpretation? If it is not an interpret interpolation, how would we uh, clarify it? How would we understand it? Very specially in the present Indian situation. Indian situation of coronavirus, during the coronavirus, the union government bringing all sorts of oppressive rules and regulations like NEET, like NEI and GST, which was uh, coming a little earlier, should be obeyed. What is your little, uh, uh, I mean, what is your opinion on that? Please uh, go ahead. If Paul had written this, um, I think he wrote it in a prosperous time. He wrote it in a time when Nero came back, uh, and then Nero was the Nero was the emperor, most probably 57 uh, CE. And at the time, everything was going well. It was a prosperous time. Mm. So at the time, we also see that Jewish people could go back to Rome. We said Claudius was against the Jewish people, but now Nero is just allowing the Jewish people to come back and settle and do business. So it was a prosperous time for the Jewish people. And so the time in which that Paul wrote, I think is a very, very important time. So when he wrote, it was a prosperous time. And at that mm -hmm. time, he did not have much problem. So he could say these things. But if Paul had written the same document six years after, oh. or five years after, mm. I really wonder if he would have written the same thing. Uh -huh. Yes, you said that he's 57 for Romans. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So it depends upon the timing as well. Yes, we need to be very careful. We need to be very careful when we uh, give the time of the epistle. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Bennett. Thank you. So Ashok Jagatiani is asking a question. Faith without works is dead. Sir, you, sir, can you elaborate a little on this? It would be interesting to hear your view and explanation on this. Thank you. That's exactly what Paul is trying to say. He is saying, uh, you know, works are very, very important, but don't make works as the means of salvation. But you have to have salvation, sorry, you, you have to club the, the works as also we are saved. When we are saved, we have to work and work along with the Holy Spirit, work by loving one another, and through which you can facilitate these things, works, and it will help us. So that's what mm. he's saying. Mm. So, Sister Jamie James is asking a question. So, please explain about the justification by faith in other religions. This concept is quite unique in the even in the Christian faith. Quite unique in a sense. We have karma idea in many of the South Asian religions. Uh, what we mean by that is that you have to. Um, work out your salvation, you have to be good, you have to go to the temple, you have to do the pujas, and you have to do the necessary things in order for you to move up in the ladder and then you can be saved. And we also have the Dharma Shastra and other things, your caste divisions, all the duties of the caste you have to do in order for you to move up in the ladder so that you can be saved. So we have so many different ways, so many different ways of working out your salvation is there. 
if you notice, I, I found something very interesting. We have this uh, a strong religious Indian idea of salvation, which is based on works and which is already there. And then apart from that, we also have so many different views were also there. We have something called Charvaka philosophy, where you can just work as you please. Just go ahead and enjoy this world, eat, drink, and then, you know, be merry. And it is the way that you work. So we had this Charvaka philosophy was there. And then Agorism was there. Agorism was the inversion of the purity ideas of the elites uh, in the religious sense, which means Agorism would just go and say that, you know, the things that were called as, un sorry, impure by the elites were seen as pure things by the agoris. Agoris will go and eat the flesh of, of um, one of the dead human beings in order for them to have this moksha, you know, mm. Uh, mm. achieve moksha. So all these ideas are there. So the way of salvation in other religions is very, very different and so many different ideas are there. And it may take another 45 minutes or one more hour to talk about that. <laughs> so I give time to Johnson Rajendra. He has some concerns and questions. Sir, Mehboob also has something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will give it. Johnson? Johnson Rajendra? You are mute, Johnson. Um, thank you, sir, for this opportunity. Um, I'm just... Um, uh, overwhelmed by the lecture that our dear sir Dr. Bennett has given. I'm just feeling that I'm sitting in his class after several years, maybe five years later. And um, wonderful to listen to our sir again. Uh, just a thought, sir, about the, uh, Paul being antinomian. I'm just bringing back James D.G. Dunn's thought. Is he only targeting the uh, boundary markers uh, that he might call it in relation to the boundary markers like Sabbath observance, circumcision, and uh, dietary loss. Is he against only these three? So I, uh, or is he against all the other things like? We uh, see Sanders in his book, uh, in, in this book on Paul and Palestinian Judaism, he appeared as if that he is blaming Paul as if he doesn't know about Judaism and uh, he did not know the Judaism of his time. But in the next book, uh, Paul, the Law and the Jewish People, but he goes and shows a little different idea where he goes and says that, you know, Paul would have accommodated obeying the law for other things, but only the circumcision and the boundary marker aspect of it, he would strongly be against. That is the idea that he is giving, but he is not strongly saying that we, we can only infer these things in his thing. So I, 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 I mean, point blank asked him personally in a short talk that I had, I had about 40 minutes with him. So I just point blank asked him, what do you think about it? Um, use a solution to the problem. And if he sees the solution, sent Jesus Christ as a solution. So he has to create a problem and he made law as the problem. And do you really say that? And so I just asked this one and he said something very interesting. He said that, you know, Paul would have accommodated law obedience for sanctification. So he did not answer my question on solution to the problem thing. The main reason is that if we agreed with this point, then his solution to the problem is a major question. So Paul's major problem with the law was circumcision and the boundary marker, thing like that. If, if it was the major problem, then solution to the problem may not really be the thesis to explain Paul's role. So I did not push on that, but it is a view that I just want to share. So thank, thank you. you so much, sir. Uh, now I give uh, time to Raghavan the Mahabub Noble from Pakistan. Thank you, Dr. Lawrence, for your uh, lecture. Uh, I have just two questions. One is related to the previous question. Uh, the first, you did mention Paul's strategy of presenting the gospel, uh, uh, devaluing the message of others in order, to some degree, uh, to show the value of your own product. How relevant is that in our own time? And that's the first thing. Uh, Paul uses almost a kind of polemical, rhetorical approach in some of his letters, uh, in, in Galatians as well. So how, how do we, you know, can we use the same 
a kind kind of method in our own time. The other uh, um, uh, question is about dietary laws again, you know, in our own context uh, where whenever uh, there is kind of Eid festivals and other things, uh, people begin to preach about uh, dietary laws and uh, put a lot of emphasis on not, n not to, to have these, you know, Eid, uh, you know, uh, gift, don't accept that and don't eat. You may have some similar things in, in India, I don't know. But especially in Pakistan and in any majority Muslim countries, these are the things which are very kind of hotly debated um, uh, over time. So what is your opinion on that? When we claim exclusivity, we have to assume the others are wrong. So exclusivity as a philosophical concept itself says that uh, all the other points of views other than the one that you hold is wrong. Whether we stress it, whether we say it, whether we uh, say it out in front, or we subtly manage that one. We have to say it. And also, see, with the postmodern idea, it's a bit different. If you are with the postmodern idea, if we accept every other idea, we don't, we don't have any problem. But when we come with Christianity, at least predominant practice Christianity, and also Islam and pure the religion, that we have exclusivity in the philosophical concept itself. And in that sense, we have to argue against others. But how gracefully you argue, that is what uh, is important. If one thing that this postmodern world has taught us is that at least to be graceful, to graceful in approaching the other religious worldviews or other ideas. I still remember, I still remember we going with few missionaries and preaching the gospel to several places where the missionaries would just come and talk about the idols as stones and nothing and all these things, even ghosts. Mm. Mm. Just go on and talk about these things. Uh, but it's not a good approach at present. It is not the way to go about it. We have to be more sensitive. And especially uh, in a gathering like this where we have many ecumenical friends also. I think we have to accommodate others. Paul could just share his idea in his time with that strong approach that he had. But for us, we may have to use little different rhetoric. So the final question is from uh, Austin. Uh, Paul praises the Romans saying, your faith is proclaimed in all the world. This is Romans chapter 1, right? Why then does he launch into long drawn or arguments about the basics of salvation? Is he trying re-evangelize a community that he has not himself founded and also uh, alongside of that also how can we understand what Paul is doing in the epistles in the light of his statement in chapter 15 verse 20 where he says I make it my ambition to preach the gospel not where Christ has already been named lest I build on someone else's foundation? It's a good question. Uh, I have too many thoughts. I have to organize it all together. I hope I answer your question directly. Uh, I like this book by Scott McKnight, and this book is called Reading Romans Backwards. What uh, Scott McKnight is saying is that <coughs> the Romans from backwards, from chapter 12, 13, 14, and 15, it's much better. We can understand the whole reason why Paul is trying to write. And he identifies that the Jewish minority who had just come into the church are not accommodated by the majority Gentiles. So Paul was really concerned about them. And he is saying that you have to accommodate them. This is the major reason why Paul is writing. Apart from that, he also has another reason. He is now going to Jerusalem. So many oppositions were there already. And now as he's going to Jerusalem, he has to go in front of the leaders and then he has to defend his gospel. So he's already thinking about how to present the gospel in a logical manner. So he already is working out on those things. So it's there in his mind fresh. And then he also brings these two things. And then third issue is that he has to go to Spain. He needs funds and he needs other things. So a logical presentation of the gospel is very important. When he writes all these things, there is a possibility that the church will see that it is not a false gospel like um, I mean, few people are talking about. So they may also support Paul. So in that sense, 
So all these reasons come together and then Paul is writing this one in such a way that the gospel is this one. This is the gospel. You are not acting according to the gospel. You have to act according to, 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 uh, to, to the gospel and you have to accommodate the weaker brethren in, in the church. And so he is just writing the details of the gospel so beautifully. And then later on, he says that you have to accommodate the weaker brethren. So if I go with Scott McKnight, the reason why he's writing all these things is to remind them the true gospel and how they have to live. They have to live in a holy sense and how it is by loving one another. So he's just bringing that as the crux of his argument. And so he's saying, if you are saved, you have to obey the law by love and which is to accommodate the weaker brethren. So that's why he's writing those things. I don't think he's just uh, re-evangelizing the whole church. So thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Bennett, for your erudite presentation. And uh, he was beginning his lecture right away from Galatians chapter 3, 28. That is considered as the Magna Carta of Christian faith. And uh, in that way, he was developing his ideology and running through these two books where the linking statement is uh, justification by faith. That is that Paul's rhetoric is very unique, okay, when we consider the epistles as a whole. So as a Johannian student, I can say that John's gospel is the next level of Paul's theology. Okay, the next level of Paul's theology. Both the Pauline and the Johannian communities were open and at the same time conservative. So sometimes when I think about the Paul's epistles and his brainstorming and uh, conceptualization, what I find is that Paul is uh, a very strategical theologian. He knows how to speak according to the occasion. Okay, so in that way, so is that uh, uh, that is one of the significant things we can learn from uh, Paul's epistles, how we can strategize our rhetoric and speak according to the situational okay, beckonings. So that makes the Pauline epistles uh, uh, significant even in today's context. And as Dr. Bennett was uh, talking about the legalistic nomism, pneumatic nomism, agapal nomism, and various sorts of nomisms. Okay? So we could see that how okay, Paul is a man who was Okay, still influential in today's contemporary context, okay, both in uh, gospel witnessing as well as uh, human transformation and human okay, communitarian okay, uh, aspects. So thank you so much, Dr. Bellet. And is that uh, our question for the next week is, uh, Assignment for the next week is Paul's concept of justification in Romans and in Galatians and its implications in the contemporary context. Let me repeat that. Paul's concept of justification in Romans and Galatians and its implications in the contemporary context. Whether it can be in Pakistan or in the Indian context or in the Burmese context or the Sri Lankan context or whatever context you belong. Okay, from that perspective, you have to bring the implications. So next week we are going to have another following scholar. He is none other than okay, Dr. Schoffendaj, and he is going to speak about the Corinthian correspondence. Mm. Corinthian correspondence. So thank you so much. Is, is there anything, Nilun? Nothing, sir. I think it, it's all fine. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much.